Now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Candace Bonterio, a Black, queer, feminist lawyer, writer, social justice advocate working at the intersections of law, policy, reproductive justice, racial justice, economic justice, mental wellness, and LGBTQ plus liberation. Candace is the Director of Racial Justice Policy and Strategy at Columbia Law School's Center for Gender and Sexuality Law and an esteemed colleague of mine. She previously worked at Planned Parenthood, the National LGBTQ Task Force, and at the ACLU. I'm thrilled to welcome you, Candace. Thank you so much. It's so, so nice to be here with everyone. I've learned so much from all of the panels that have come before, and I'm just really excited to welcome you all to panel number four, which is gender justice and the ERA in practice. So I just want to start with a quick grounding of why we're here, why we're in this space together. And then I will introduce some of the panelists and they will present, and then we will go to a moderated question and answer session. But I'm so excited to dig in. So let's just dig in. So this, this panel, the gender justice and ERA in practice, will investigate how explicit gender protection in the constitution could transform federal laws in different areas of the law in practice to address the pressing needs of today. You'll hear about how the ERA will inform abortion access, anti-pregnancy discrimination, reproductive health access, maternal mortality, medical coverage, paid leave, the childcare infrastructure and the care economy, workers' rights, just so many things, so many things. And the reason that we're able to really talk about the ERA in practice is because we are going to ground this conversation in a reproductive justice lens. And as many of you know, reproductive justice is a framework and a movement that was started in 1994 by Black women in order to center the experiences of Black women. So sometimes there's a misnomer of the reproductive justice movement was started as a way to be in confrontation or be in opposition with the reproductive rights or reproductive health movements, but it really wasn't. It was a, a movement to center the lived experiences and needs of Black women in particular, but in, it's an expansive framework that allows for the inclusion of Black femmes, non-binary folks, and really all people of, of color and what I like to call all made to be marginalized people because no one is born marginalized but majority culture makes folks marginalized. And so we're made to be marginalized. And it, reproductive justice allows for an intersectional look at all of our lives and how all of these different pieces from paid leave to maternal mortality are really connected. And, and this conversation will dive into how the Equal Rights Amendment could be a potential strategy for helping move all of the intersections into a framework of actual liberation. So reproductive justice will be achieved when all people have the ability to determine if, when, and how to not have a child, to have a child, and to parent the children that they have in safe and healthy environments. And reproductive justice really lends itself to an intersectional frame and it's a whole person experience. It's the ability to have proper housing, to live in an environmentally safe area, to have food, to have the ability to access healthcare. It's really about that access piece. And so I just wanted to ground us into that conversation as I, before I, I hand it over to the panelists so that we remind ourselves that reproductive justice and the ERA do go hand in hand and the ERA is a method to further reproductive justice. So with that, I'm gonna turn it to my esteemed panelist, and I am going to start with Michelle Goodwin, who I'm fangirling over here about. Well, I'm fangirling about all of you, but Michelle, I'm just really excited to have, have you start the conversation. And Michelle Goodwin is the Chancellor's Professor of Law and Director for the Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy at UC Irvine Law School. Michelle Goodwin is, the founding director of the Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy. She is the recipient of the 2020 to 2021 Distinguished Senior Faculty Award for Research, the highest honor bestowed by the University of California. She is also the first law professor at the University of California, Irvine to receive this award. She is an elected member of the American Law Institute, as well as an elected fellow of the American Bar Foundation and the Hastings Center, the organization central to the founding of bioethics. 
She is the American Law Institute advisor for the resentment third of torts remedies. She is credited with helping to establish and shape the health law field. She directed the first ABA accredited health law program in the nation and established the first law center focused on race and bioethics. Her health law scholarship is hailed as exceptional in the New England Journal of page five of 15 medicine. She ranks among the most cited professors in the field, trained in sociology and anthropology. Professor Goodwin has conducted field research in Asia, Africa, Europe, and North America, focusing on human trafficking, which includes marriage, sex, organs, and other bio biologics. Her books include Policing the Womb, Invisible Women, and the Criminalization of Motherhood, Biotechnology, Bioethics and the Law, Baby Markets, Money and the Politics of Creating Families, and Black Markets, The Supply and Demand of Body Parts. So welcome, 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 and I turn it over to you to lead off our discussion. Well, Candace, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. And I'm just so honored to be on this panel and a part of this conversation. When I look on my screen and I see who's here, um, I just have the, the sort of biggest smile in my heart. So you, exactly, girl. So um, what an important time to be having this conversation. And uh, I want to start off with grounding the conversation about why some people might be resistant to the idea that the ERA matters to conversations about reproductive health rights and justice. And the reality is that when we think about the ERA, and it has now been ratified by 38 states, uh, and we're waiting for the archivist to do the archivist's work, um, but when we think about this, you know, some might say, well, aren't there other measures of equality that are already within our constitution? But let's be clear that we have a very dated constitution itself. Uh, we have a constitution where if we're relying on the premises of the 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment, let's be clear, that's 1865 that we're talking about. And other democracies in the world, or in fact, countries that didn't exist but now do exist, or that have gotten rid of apartheid and other things have adapted and adopted constitutional frameworks that specifically protect um, vulnerable groups, that protect women, that protect LGBTQ people. And the United States has not uh, done that. And in many ways, it's no surprise. Um, even when we think about um, the first reconstruction of, you know, eight, leading with 1865 and the ratification of the 13th Amendment. Um, there were very serious floor debates that yet framed Black people as still being property. Um, the fight was, it was not as if there wasn't a fight then. Um, and so when one thinks about that, perhaps not a surprise that there continues to be a fight today. So the first thing is to understand that we have a very dated constitution that has actually not done the work of actually mapping the arc of equality in our country that actually has not even incorporated the principles that we learned during what one might say is the second reconstruction, which would be the civil rights movement in the United States. We don't see the principles and values that came from that time actually embedded in our United States constitution. And we actually see the vulnerability of what that second reconstruction looked like in the fragmentation and the dismantling of the 19 of the strength, if you will, of the um, rights that were established through the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. I mean, we're living right in that time of seeing the vulnerability there and the dismantling. And the final piece that I'll say before further opening up and level setting to where we are today is to say that, you know, as the legislative process can be a beacon of hope, which we can see through the 64 Civil Rights Act and also 65 Voting Rights Act, 
We can also see how vulnerable that process can be as well. Um, we can look and see what that looks like even today when there's voter suppression taking place that is directly connected to the topic of what we're discussing today in terms of reproductive health rights and justice. Um, and so while we could have a 1964 Voting Rights Act and 65, 65 Voting Rights Act, so we see the vulnerability over time of the legislative process. The same is true with regard to the courts as well. We can also see the back you know, um, sliding of the court in protecting constitutional rights. Um, and we see that very clearly today with SB 8 and how a supermajority on the Supreme Court failed to intervene in a case that for so many reasons were right for the Supreme Court uh, to intervene, um, where legislation challenged the very authority of the Supreme Court. Um, and then also the precedential value of Roe v. Wade. And we see what this threat looks like in the wake of the Dobbs um, case, which is now being heard by the United States Supreme Court. So I wanted to sort of structurally frame that before talking about then what's at risk and then what's the opportunity in these times. So what, what's at risk today is that we see the very dramatic dismantling of reproductive rights in the United States. But I'd also like to say that this is also not new. We're kind of waking up to the nightmare that black and brown women have been living for a very long time and indigenous women too, right? So we're waking up to a reality that um, if we, I mean, how far do we need to go, right? We could go back to Sojourner Truth saying, ain't I a woman? And I saw nearly 13 of my children snatched from my arm and nobody heard my cry, but God, ain't I a woman? So we could go way back um, in terms of that. But if we just take a kind of modern view to level set and see where the dangers actually happen to be, then looking at the 1980s and the 1990s with black women being dragged out of hospitals, shackled and chained and in bloodied gowns where prosecutors were successful, were able to successfully leverage um, their own platforms that weren't even made into law yet, um, using things like child abuse statutes to go after uh, people who had, who used um, drugs during pregnancy, essentially, right? I mean, that was the platform, this kind of perfect storm of the war on drugs, this sort of um, war on welfare, and then the sort of euphemistic crack mom being, you know, kind of established in this kind of perfect storm of a thing. And in many ways, we see the failure of being mindful with regard to race and class during that particular time, because as prosecutors were using existing child abuse statutes to go after women who might have had low birth weight babies, or maybe there was a miscarriage or a stillbirth, this was the establishment of kind of personhood into American reproductive ideology. And the failure to have seen that at the time in its most glaring ways was a huge mistake. And I think that has a lot to say about the kind of demographics of the reproductive rights movement. Um, and I think it has a lot to, to say about the prioritization, the sort of failure to see that when one thinks about reproductive rights, it's not just abortion, but it has to be understood as a kind of full circle and wheel. I mean, I think if we draw the comparative to a civil rights movement, then we very well understand that it wasn't just about Brown v. Board of Education. There would have been no civil rights movement if it was just less secure Black kids being able to have textbooks that equal in the quality to white classmates, then what is the point? But it was about every other instant where there had been the denial of equal treatment under law. And that included in employment, it included in housing, it included in access to accommodations, and so much more. And we saw really that failure at hand within this particular space. And so part of what we see is a dramatic attack for which thinking about an equality framework and equal rights and move, uh, amendment will do some real work for us. But at the same time, um, we will fail in this space too if we don't recognize implicit and explicit biases and movements that have failed to recognize and center the concerns of black and brown women and indigenous women as part of the broader concern. And so what we see today then is not just the threat in terms of abortion rights in ways that are absolutely dramatic and off the sort of table, right? To center that is to think about 1973, Roe v. Wade is a seven to two 
decision, and five of those justices are Republican appointed. Justice Blackman himself is put on the court by Richard Nixon. We're talking about a time in which Prescott Bush, who was the father of George H.W. Bush, was the treasurer for Planned Parenthood. So as we level set, we are in a time that is like off the map and like in a kind of nether, never, never, nether, nether land, right, is where we are um, today in terms of what this all represents. But it's not just abortion, right? It's maternal mortality, right? It's the US leading all industrialized nations and those beyond that in terms of a failure to keep people alive who are trying to be pregnant or have been coerced into maintaining their pregnancies, a horrible rate in terms of infant mortality. I mean, if we look at those together, we know that it's safer to give birth in Bosnia than it is in the United States. And we know that if we drill deeper underneath that and we look at race, nationally Black women are three and a half times more likely to die by carrying a pregnancy to term than their white counterparts. But if we look within the spaces where there has been this kind of prolific, aggressive type of anti-abortion legislating, in certain counties, then Black women are 10 times more likely, 15 times more likely, 17 times more likely to die than their white counterparts by carrying pregnancies to term. And we have failed within popular media and also within the scholarly space to name that for what it is, right? I mean, and when you think about it, just 10 years ago, it would have seemed alarmist to use the terminology of white supremacy. Now we can use it after Heather Heyer has died and the scaling of the Capitol, and we can talk about white supremacy and we see it in the flags and the jargon and everything. So it's not as if those of us who would be yelled off the stage by using the terminology of white supremacy today because it's around us and legislators are even, you know, brandishing it in their speeches. But we also have to think about the kind of death penalty that's put on people who don't want to be pregnant, who are coerced into staying pregnant in the very states where we know that there are these alarmingly high rates of mortality. What else do we call that when a state says we're going to coerce you into a condition where our own data shows us you have a high risk of dying when we do this to you. And our failure to capture that and make its historical connection, especially by the populations who are most affected, is a real mistake, right? In that way, we see a narrative that takes us from slavery right into the present. So now let me begin to wrap up by talking about what I offer in policing the womb that might address some of this, though not all of it. And again, this is just another shout out to my co-panelists who have just so much richness to uh, offer to this conversation. So I'm in happy, happy land, happy space here. Um, but in a policing the womb in its last chapter, I propose lessons for law and society, a reproductive justice new deal or bill of rights such that we can think in more um, definitive ways about the time in which we're in and what it what might look like to actually center in constitutional space um, the concerns that we all have here, which go from pregnancy to childcare and, and abortion and so much more. And so, I, you know, what I argue is that um, what we are missing is actually centering the a uh, right of self-determination, the right of personhood, the recognition of a right to self-determination um, in women and people who have the capacity to become a pregnant. And so I argue that the Reproductive Justice Bill of Rights does not use the universal person because it lacks an emphasis on the specific subordination of women. And of course, that is true too, and what we see with um, non-binary people and trans folks. And that despite guarantees of, quote, equality for all, women remain locked out. Importantly, this platform includes concerns for transgender persons, women, men as well. And so what might this personhood contain? And I'll just quickly tick off a few, um, and then I'm happy to engage more in Q&A. First is that the personhood of all women shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The personhood of a woman shall at all times take priority in all matters, including concerns relating to health and dignity. It is sad that that would seem to be a radical concept, um, but I think that that just shows how far it is that we're away from the margins. And then second, 
Um, a woman's right to bodily autonomy, privacy, and equality under law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The right to bodily autonomy shall include the right to decide if, when, how to procreate. And I'll just read a couple more and leave the rest for later. Reproductive self-determination shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. And four, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States um, on account of sex. It is seven, five. Um, a woman's right to speech shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on the basis of sex. Speech shall not be imposed by the United States or any state on the basis of sex. The right to assemble peacefully shall not be denied or abridged by the United States and so forth. Now you might wonder as I conclude why I was thinking about speech in other areas. And that is because when we think about the wholeness of this space, um, what's at stake is not just simply what happens in reproductive capacities, but it is life itself, which actually in the comfort of being able to live one's life in a full and just and dignified matter that happens to be at stake. And I'll just conclude with this final word in terms of what that means just in terms of voting rights. It's not a surprise to me, and I'm very happy that Judge Carlton Reeves in footnotes in the order that blocked the Mississippi law from going into effect, cited Fannie Lou Hamer and talked about Fannie Lou Hamer and the infamous Mississippi appendectomy and how little black girls as young as 11, 12 years old were being coercively sterilized in that state. You can't divorce this kind of history of what life has been like in, the, in being shut out of the rule of law, shut out of voting, shut out of the basic fundamental protections. You can't divorce that from a conversation about reproductive health rights and justice and about equality. And I think that's really something important for us to um, hold those connections. And with that, I'm gonna stop right there. Candace, thank you so much for uh, having me and looking forward to hearing from my co-panelists. Thank you so much. And I love that intersectional send off of how all of these are all of these laws and all of these rights are actually connected and with voting rights being the foundation of a healthy democracy how that is also very intertwined with all of the issues that we're discussing today so thank you and with that I'm going to pass it to Kate Andreas and Kate Andreas is a professor of law at Columbia Law School and she teaches and writes in the fields of constitutional law labor law and administrative law her scholarship probes the failures of US law to protect workers' rights, examines the efforts of historical and contemporary worker movements to transform legal structures, and analyzes how labor law and constitutional governance might be reformed to enable greater political and economic democracy. Drawing from constitutional law, administrative law, and legal history perspectives, she also has explored the relationship between law and the perpetuation of economic inequality. She frequently provides advice on policy initiatives to legislators and workers' rights organizations and works on related litigation. Prior to law school, Ms. Andreas worked for several years as an organizer with the Service Employer Employees International Union, or SEIU. After receiving a JD from Yale Law School, she clerked for a judge Stephen Reinhardt of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the U.S. Supreme Court. Andreas practiced political law at, per Perkins Cole, at Perkins Cole and served as associate counsel and special assistant to President Barack Obama and as chief of staff in the White House Counsel's Office. She joined the faculty of Michigan Law School in 2013, and she was the recipient of Michigan Law School's L. Hart Wright Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2016. She joined the faculty of Columbia Law School in 2021 and also has served as an academic fellow at Columbia Law School and taught American constitutional law as a visiting professor at La Institute de Etons Politiques Science Po in Paris. Andreas currently serves as a commissioner in the repertoire for the Presidential Commission on the Supreme Court and sits on the board of academic advisors of the American Constitution Society. Welcome, Kate. 
Thank you. It's so good to be with you. And I actually am no longer on the commission, so I can speak freely uh, and not as a, as a um, uh, you know. So anyway, I'm delighted to be here um, for this really important conference. And I want to thank Catherine and Ting Ting and Candace and the students on the journal and, and my uh, co-panelists. Um, it's I'm not an ERA expert. I have learned so much from the panels in the last day and a half, um, as well as from some really terrific research um, from two CLS students who I just wanted to shout out, Abby Flanagan and Ridgely Willier. So um, my expertise is really on um, constitutional law and labor law more generally, and I wanted to just step back for a moment um, and, and think a little bit about the implications of the ERA for women workers and for problems of economic justice. Um, and I'll start by um, echoing the comments of others from earlier panels, um, which is just to say that having the ERA in the Constitution is crucial. It is unconscionable that our constitution does not formally guarantee sex equality, that it doesn't expressly recognize the full equality of more than half of the country's population. And even if the ERA doesn't or can't accomplish more than what has already been achieved under the 14th Amendment, I don't think that's the case. But even if it were the case, it's hugely important that the constitution enshrine the principle of sex equality. So my starting point is that the ERA is essential. Still, I think it's important to acknowledge that the ERA has historically not been a goal of most working class women's um, movements. In fact, there's a long history of tension between the views of labor feminists on the one hand and the reformers who originally pushed for the ERA on the other. I mean, I think that understanding this history helps illuminate the limits of existing sex equality jurisprudence and also offer some inspiration for how we can work not only to ratify the ERA or to ensure it's, um, that it actually is officially ratified, but to continue to transform the ERA into a source for real equality for women, not just wealthy women, not just professional women, but also for poor women, working class women, women of color and immigrant women. So I wanted to say a few words about that history, drawing on the work of really great scholars like Dorothy Sue Cobble and Landon Storrs and Rebecca DeWolf, as well as legal historians um, like Serena Mayeri, who was on the last panel, and Debbie Dinner. Um, and then I'll turn to some of the contemporary applications. Um, so from the 1920s until the 1960s, a really significant divide existed, <clears throat> excuse me, between labor union women and progressive women on the one hand and ERA advocates on the other. Women in the labor movement opposed the ERA, not because they didn't believe in equality, but because they thought it was elite driven and elite serving. And indeed, many of the original proponents of the ERA were elite and were not actually supportive of broader labor rights. A number of the women who led the National Women's Party, the NWP, um, rarely favored legislative measures designed to enhance labor standards or union rights generally. Many of them thought that women like men should be allowed to operate in the market without hindrances or protections. Progressive women's groups and labor groups like the Consumer League criticized that view for, for really offering women an abstract theoretical equality while obstructing progress towards substantive equality for women who face real disadvantages of class. And they argued that the NWP program was designed for an idealized labor market in which women and workers generally enjoyed boundless opportunity, but that was not the real labor market. Um, there was some merit to this critique. For example, when the Supreme Court struck down the minimum wage for women in the 1923 Adkins case, the NWP applauded, arguing that women were as capable as men in contracting for their jobs. It was almost a lochner view of women's liberty. The Consumer League, which focused on issues facing working class and poor women took a different approach. They tried to fashion solutions aimed at the labor market as it actually was with the aim of transforming that reality. They were willing to restrict the opportunities of some individual workers and women in particular in order to win laws that would lay a floor for labor standards. So they were willing to accept statutes that were um, gender specific, that were specific if they were raising the floor. Um, in the NWP view, this was a mistake because it allowed, it even required women to be treated differently from men. But the Consumers League and other labor feminists argued in response that creating floors of any sort would improve workers' lives and would also reduce employers' power over workers. So the goal was not just to protect women, but to shift power dynamics in the political economy. And the ERA was worrisome from this perspective. Labor feminists feared that the ERA would be used to eliminate the floors that they had been able to win, even in the Lochner era, laws that helped women achieve more dignity and more power in the economic sphere. 
So that was the early history, but over time, the gulf between elite feminists and working class activists narrowed. And this happened for a few reasons. For one, the Fair Labor Standards Act, which was enacted in 1938, displaced the rationale for sex-based labor legislation because it provided um, a floor for all workers, although uh, important caveat to that in a moment. Um, and the NLRA um, enacted in 1935 also enabled union organizing and collective bargaining among female and male workers alike. But um, both of these statutes shamefully excluded domestic workers as well as agricultural workers. In short, African-American workers and African-American women in particular. So these two kind of key statutes that established labor rights excluded most black women in the South. Um, yet because, they, because these statutes created employment rights and union rights generally, they eliminated the need for women's specific protective legislation. And that trend of eliminating sex specific um, labor protections continued during World War II. Um, and over the next decades, employment protections expanded for all workers. So as sex specific employment protections came to be obsolete, ERA proponents could actually now increasingly argue with confidence that the ERA would not threaten the health and safety of women workers. And by the late 60s, many labor activists no longer feared the ERA, many even came to support it. And joining forces with ERA, proponents, they agreed to both press for the ERA and also to pursue sex equality at work through the 14th Amendment in the meantime. And as is well known and has been discussed in the earlier panels in a series of cases beginning in the 70s and culminating with the Virginia military opinion that Justice Ginsburg wrote in 1996, equality advocates won the dismantling of most sex-based classifications in the law. But as we've heard about a lot already in this conference, the version of sex equality that was achieved in courts, like the version of race equality, although important in many ways, is wholly inadequate. And in fact, it's worse than inadequate. In the hands of the current Supreme Court, the Equal, equal Protection Clause may soon mean that any effort to affirmatively remedy race inequality or maybe even sex inequality, even without explicitly relying on race or <clears throat> is actually a violation of equal protection. It really turns the meaning of equal protection on its head. Um, and at the same time, under the rubric of religious liberty, the court is increasingly allowing private entities to engage in sex discrimination. So although most sex-based classifications have been removed from the law, discrimination and inequality persist. And the problems facing working women in particular, working class women in particular, low-wage workers, workers of color, immigrant workers are dire, and they have become even more so during the pandemic. Women continue to be paid less than men when working in comparable jobs, and even more striking jobs that have historically been women's jobs, jobs in which women predominate are much, much lower paid, and workers in those jobs have many fewer rights. So as I previously mentioned, domestic work was systematically and intentionally excluded from federal labor and employment protections when those laws were enacted, and it continues to be excluded from many federal and state employment and labor laws today. The problem of low wages and few rights is not limited to domestic work. Nearly half of all working women work in jobs paying low wages with median earnings of only about $10, $10 or $11 an hour. The share of workers earning low wages is higher among black women and Latino women than among white women, but it's lower for, but, but low wages are, are, are lower for all women. And that's just paid work. Women do a huge amount of caregiving of children and family members that is wholly unpaid. But the U.S. has no, the, fed, uh, the federal level has no paid family leave rule. The vast majority of low-income workers lack paid family leave. And meanwhile, childcare remains unaffordable and inaccessible for many women. So I highlight these facts because I don't think we can have a society committed to equal rights until we address these problems, as well as problems of discrimination. Changing any of this is unlikely to come from litigation in the courts, in my view, at least not primarily. Um, rather, it requires organizing and legislation. Unfortunately, here too, there are obstacles because the court is currently making it harder for, for legislatures to address these issues by adopting narrow interpretations of the Commerce Clause and of Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, as well as by creating new protections for discrimination and new obstacles to redistributive legislation under the First Amendment and the Fifth Amendment, the Takings Clause. And the court is crafting new constitutional and administrative law doctrine that threatens to disable the government from addressing these pressing problems facing women through administrative agencies. So would the ERA change any of this? 
in one sense, I'm actually quite pessimistic. I think there's little reason to think the current court would take a different approach to the ERA than it has to the 14th Amendment or other parts of the Constitution. Still, I don't think that means we ought to despair. Because in fact, I think there is actually there should be real hope that the ERA can be vested with a more capacious definition of equality over time. And one place I would point for hope is to the really significant and inspiring organizing activity occurring among women workers. Really important organizing activity among domestic workers, nail salon workers, teachers, healthcare workers, and other female-dominated workforces. These workers are speaking out against sexual harassment. They're speaking out against the devaluing of care work. They're demanding that their work be treated with dignity and fairly compensated and that they have a voice on the job. And they're demanding better working conditions and union rights for all workers, both through collective action and through enacting new state and local legislation. And here, I think through their organizing, we can actually see the outlines of a really different vision of equality than the one advanced by the conservative court. So I do think following their lead, the ERA needs to be and can be invested with a broader meaning than the one that the conservative justices give to equal protection. Um, like others who um, have spoken in the, during this conference, I agree that battles about the ERA's meaning primarily need to be fought in Congress, as well as in state legislatures and in the public sphere, and not first and foremost in the courts, at least not before this court. So what might arguments for a broader conception of equal rights look like? First and foremost, equal rights needs to be understood as anti-subordination, not just anti-classification. But also in addition to fighting against problems of sex discrimination, it is essential to fight for the rights that enable all people within the US to interact as equals without being position of domination over one another. So this means among other things, fighting to end autocratic power in the workplace. And it also means ensuring that all jobs are jobs with dignity and that care work and social reproduction is truly valued. So looking back to the history with which I began, and I'll close here, I think we can take the best from both the, um, the vision of the original ERA proponents and the labor feminists of the early 20th century and others whose voices were left out of both of those debates. And we work, can work towards a vision of the ERA and our society that truly embraces equality. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I have so many questions, but I'm going to pause and save them for later. Um, but thank you so much for the, the history. It's always really important to ground our current reality into the history of past movements and how everything is connected. So I really, really appreciate the, the workers' rights history. Um, and I'm, I am interested in seeing where we are today with the connection between the ERA movement and the workers' rights movement. And we'll get to that at a later time. And for now, I'm going to pass it over to my esteemed panelists, Professor Kara Bridges, who is a professor of law at UC Berkeley School of Law. She has written many articles concerning race, class, reproductive rights, and the intersection of the three. Her scholarship has appeared in the Harvard Law Review, the Stanford Law Review, the Columbia Law Review, the California Law Review, and NYU Law Review, and the Virginia Law Review, among others. She's also the author of three books, Reproducing Race, an Ethnography of Pregnancy at the Site of Racialization, The Poverty of Privacy Rights, and Critical Race Theory, A Primer. She is a co-editor of the Reproductive Justice book series that is published under the imprint of the University of California Press. She graduated as valedictorian from Spelman College, receiving her degree in three years. She received her JD from Columbia Law School and her PhD with distinction from Columbia University's Department of Anthropology. While in law school, she was a teaching assistant for the former Dean, Dean LeBron of Tor she was a teacher's assistant in, the tor in his torts class, as well as for the late E. Allen Farnsworth. She was a member of the Columbia Law Review and a Kent scholar. She speaks fluent Spanish and basic Arabic, and she is a classically trained ballet dancer, which is incredibly exciting. And I would love to see how ballet has translated for you into the work that you do. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Bridges. Thank you so much for that introduction. And it's really an honor to be here with my wonderful co-panelists and to be a part of this um, conversation about the ERA. So I am going to share my screen, hopefully successfully. 
um, and I am going to play from the start. And I'm going to talk today about um, how the ERA and how um, sex equality specifically talks to a specific um, law, and that law is uh, family cap policies. And I will explain what those are for those who are unfamiliar. So in my remarks today, I want to uh, review the arguments um, that scholars have made for abortion rights as a species of sex equality. And then I wanna apply those arguments to the context of family cap policies, also known as child exclusion policies. So I will start essentially with a brief review of the previous panel about abortion rights um, and sex equality. And then I will move into a, a discussion of family caps and apologies in advance uh, to Reba Siegel because her ears are going to burn throughout <laughs> the next 15 minutes. Um, so the argument that abortion rights are, are better grounded in equality principles is that argument begins with the observation that abortion restrictions coerce cis women who become pregnant to perform traditional gender roles. Um, as Reva Siegel has documented in her scholarship, during the 19th century campaigns to criminalize abortion, abortion opponents explicitly argued that abortion was dangerous and ought to be criminalized because it allowed cis women an exit from the status of wife and mother. She writes in her foundational uh, law review article on this question, um, the doctors who advocated criminalizing abortion quite openly argued that regulating women's reproductive conduct was necessary, not merely to protect potential life, but also to ensure women's performance of marital and maternal obligations. Now, while the arguments against abortion have shifted over, the, over time, and while it is rare to hear abortion opponents make the case that the procedure should be prescribed because women ought to be forced to perform traditional gender roles, the relationship between access to abortion and the ability to reject those gender roles has remained unchanged. Laws prescribing abortion violate equal citizenship principles because they compel people with the capacity for pregnancy to perform the work of motherhood and a society still organized around the understanding that those who bear and raise children do not engage in the labor that society most highly values and centrally associates with citizenship. Indeed, Justice Ginsburg observed the relationship between abortion access and sex equality in her dissent in Gonzalez versus Carhartt. There she wrote that legal challenges to undue restrictions on abortion procedures do not seek to vindicate some generalized notion of privacy, rather they center on a woman's autonomy to determine her life's course and thus to enjoy equal citizenship stature. So with that brief review, I want to turn now to family cap or child exclusion policies. Um, so the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Program, or TANF for short, is colloquially known as welfare. It is the program that provides cash assistance to indigent families. Currently, 12 states have family cap policies in their TANF programs. In states that do not adopt a family cap policy, the number of individuals in a family determines the size of the family's grant in the program. Accordingly, if the number of individuals in a family increases because of the birth of a child or the addition of another dependent person in the household, then the size of the grant increases. So to provide a very simple example, let's say that there is a family of two, look at that little baby. Okay, let's say that there's a family of two, a mother and a child, and let's say that the family receives a TANF grant of $100 a month. Let's say then that the mother transforms into somebody else. Now, anyway, let's say that the mother has another child um, and now the family consists of three people. The grant should increase in order to accommodate the increased expenses associated with an expanded family. So in this example, let's say that now because this family has gone from two people to three people, the size of the grant will increase, let's say to $133 a month. Family caps freeze the amount of a family's welfare grant, making the grant unresponsive to increases in, families, um, in family size. So in my example, we're back to a family of two receiving $100. Um, let's say that this family expands, becomes three people. Family caps say, no, you still get $100. We will not allow your grant to be responsive to increases in the size of your family. 
There, of course, are variations on this theme. Um, for example, consider the Maryland policy that was challenged in Dandridge versus Williams, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, Maryland kept the amount of a family's grant only after the family had reached a certain size. Um, accordingly, a family's grant would increase in response to the addition of new family members until the family was composed of six people. Um, at that point, the grant became static Thus, families that included seven or more individuals did not receive grants that covered their standard of need. And this was the standard that Maryland itself had calculated, which is to say Maryland was comfortable allowing um, large families, families composed of seven or more people, to go without their basic needs met. So again, 12 states currently have a family cap policy in some form. Now, there are many rationales for these policies. All of them are trash. Um, so in Dandridge versus Williams, um, Maryland defended its family cap policy with the argument that it provided an incentive uh, for gainful employment. In CK versus Shalala, um, which was a New Jersey case that presented a similar uh, family cap policy, those family cap policy was different, uh, defended in similar terms. In that case, the New Jersey court said placing a ceiling on benefits provides an incentive for parents to leave the welfare rules for the workforce. Now this rationale that family caps encourage welfare recipients to get a job essentially assumes that there are jobs out there <laughs> that welfare beneficiaries could get if they tried. It also assumes that those jobs are consistent with raising young children. The family cap policy then, uh, with this assumption that they're just designed to encourage recipients to just get a job, um, it's just a kick in the pants then, right? It's just a spur to get indigent people off of the couch, out of the door, and back into the workforce. And this rationale assumes that people are unemployed because they choose to be, because they are lazy, unmotivated, um, or irresponsible. Family cap policies are also defended with the claim that they encourage those who are receiving welfare benefits to use contraception. Um, Maryland took this tact in Dandridge versus Williams, arguing that the policy provided incentives for family planning. And in CK versus Shalala, the court accepted the proposition that the family cap policy sends a message that recipients should consider the static level of welfare benefits before having another child, a message that may reasonably have an ameliorative effect on the rate of out of wedlock births that can only foster the familial instability and crushing cycle of poverty currently plaguing the welfare class. Thanks, Jersey. So the court clearly believes that poor people's insistence upon having children outside of marriage is actually what causes poverty. Um, according to the court, if poor people would just stop having kids, then poverty itself, or at least poverty in its cyclical form, you know, the crushing cycle of poverty, then that would be closer to being overcome. Of course, the, the court there is individualizing the causes of poverty. It's a, identifying um, the, the locus of poverty and in individual behaviors and ethics and moral codes and, 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 and deficiencies, ignoring all of the structural systemic forces that produce poverty um, in this country. Now, it deserves mention that if family cap policies are supposed to reduce the number of children born to welfare beneficiaries, they simply do not work. Indeed, when Congress was considering passing TANF and authorizing states to implement family caps as part of the program, it was presented with testimony showing that there was no solid evidence for concluding that eliminating benefits would significantly reduce birth rates among welfare beneficiaries. Further, the initial evaluation of New Jersey's family cap measure revealed no statistically significant difference between birth rates of people subject to the cap and those who are not. So how do we analyze family cap policies as an issue of sex equality? This is a question of how family cap policies might fare under a robust um, interpretation of an equal rights amendment. Now, if abortion restrictions force cis women into assuming traditional gender roles, 
what do we make of family cap policies, which intentionally discourage childbirth and in so doing discourage cis women from assuming traditional gender roles? Do family cap policies reflect, reflect the belief that low-income women ought to be encouraged to achieve sex equality with men? The answer, I believe, is no. If family cap policies were actually intended to inspire or persuade low-income women to achieve equal citizenship with men, then they would come with the means that would allow low-income women to be mothers and contributors to public life. They would be implemented alongside, at the very least, programs that provide low-income mothers access to childcare and educational opportunities. This, of course, is not what has taken place. Family cap policies are what happen when the state retracts. They are what happen when the state commits itself to neoliberalism. They are demonstrations of the state's lack of commitment to the well-being in full development of low-income mothers, poor people, and poor families. Siegel's ruminations on laws restricting abortion provide an alternative lens through which we can understand family caps. She writes that if restrictions on abortion are analyzed in a social framework, they present questions concerning the regulation of motherhood and thus value judgments concerning women's roles. Essentially, laws restricting abortion reflect the belief that the other roles that become difficult or without proper support impossible for cis women to assume when they are mothers are simply not as valuable for cis women to perform. These laws, abortion restrictions, reflect a conviction that the only valuable role a person with the capacity for pregnancy can play is that of mother. Now, if laws that make abortion inaccessible and coerced childbirth can be interpreted in this manner, how should we interpret laws that discourage childbirth like family cap policies? Following Siegel's analysis, it would seem that these laws ought to be interpreted to reflect the sense that some women, poor women, are not valued and valuable when they are reproducing and raising children. They reveal the certainty that some women cannot and should not assume traditional gender roles. Some women are not good mothers. Some women are not good women. Consider as well Siegel's analysis of the values underlying 19th century arguments against abortion. She writes, and this is a longer quote, but I wanna direct your attention to the bolded language. She's talking about the doctors at the time. And doctors said that a wife had a duty to bear children, which she owed not to her husband, but to the community. It was a duty that she tacitly promised the state. Laws against abortion and contraception were necessary to protect the public's interest in procreation. And further on, the, doctor, the doctors argued that the institution of marriage was of the utmost public regulatory concern because it was responsible for the production of populations and in the production of populations lay the welfare of the state. Family cap policies also reflects an understanding of reproductive conduct as a public regulatory concern. As was true at the turn of the 19th century, reproduction today also has a public character. Family cap policies reflect the assumption that it is in the public interest for some people to avoid procreation. Those people who should avoid procreation, of course, are poor, poor people with the capacity for pregnancy. If reproduction is responsible for the production of population, like the doctors at the, 19th, at the turn of the 19th century argued, then family cap policies enact the conviction that it is better for the community and the nation when some populations are not produced. And where childbearing and child rearing by middle-class white women has always been thought to protect the health, prosperity, and longevity of the state, Childbearing and child rearing by the poor and by people of color is thought to threaten those very same things. And so I would hope that under a robust interpretation of an equal rights amendment, um, we would see the last 12 states holding on for dear life to these uh, family cap policies, that those would fall if they would be inconsistent with the demands of sex equality. And that's all I have for now. Thanks so much.
I have so many questions and so many different things going on in my mind about, oh, well, what about this? And what about this connection? But I will save them until the end. Um, but thank you so much for that, for that robust interpretation of really tying family caps into the ERA, because I think it's incredibly important to talk about who is valued as a mother in this country and who is not, and that it is very racialized and it is very it is, you know, it's very classist. So thank you for bringing that piece into the conversation. And last but not least, I am going to introduce another esteemed panelist, distinguished professor and founding director of World Policy Analyst, Analyst Center of UCLA, Jody Heyman. As director of the World Policy Analyst Center, Heyman leads an unprecedented effort to improve the level and quality of comparative policy data available to policymakers researchers and the public. WORLD, which stands for the World Policy Analysis Center, examines health and social policies and outcomes in all 193 United Nations countries. WORLD's mission is to strengthen equal opportunities worldwide by identifying the most effective public sector approaches, improving the quantity and quality of globally comparative data available, and working in partnerships to support evidence-based improvements in countries worldwide. WORLD has worked with global bodies, the WHO, UNICEF, ILO, and others, civil society, research groups, private sector leaders, and other global change agents. World's launches on policies affecting children reach people in 190 countries, as did their No Ceilings partnership with the Clinton and Gates Foundation, foundations on equal opportunities for women, men, girls, and boys. Heyman is leading initiatives on the role of constitutions in all 193 United Nations countries in realizing equal rights and improving social and economic conditions, legislative and policy approaches to advancing equality and full inclusion in education and at work of youth with disabilities in all 193 countries, and increasing transparency around what countries are doing to address the needs and rights of refugees and migrants in 150 countries. Heyman previously held a Canada Research Chair in Global Health and Social Policy at McGill University, where she was the founding director of the Institute for Health and, and Social Policy. While on the faculty at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard School of Public Health, she founded the project on global working families. And with that, I'm so excited to pass it over to Professor Heyman. Thank you so much, Candice, and many thanks to everybody at the ERA project for hosting this. And I just want to echo what a joy it is uh, to be on this panel with my co-panelists. I actually, there are going to be a lot of connections between what I have to share with what they've shared. You would think we had coordinated this closely, <laughs> um, but um, I'm going to do two things. I, I'm going to show a lot of the global data on what rights exist in constitutions and how they're implemented. My, also, how they've changed over time, how they've changed over the past 50, 60, 70 years. I'm going to do this really with two goals. One is uh, hoping that we end on a note that this that real change is within our reach to build on what Michelle Goodwin started us with, we actually really could update our constitution in uh, meaningful and transformative ways. And um, I'm also going to do this for insights about what it may or may not do. I mean, I think we've heard some warnings from the other speakers about that too. So I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and just give me one sec. Okay. And I just want to say one word in case any of the listeners are have a visual disability and are not seeing the screen, which is I will speak as well for what I'm showing. And I will, after the talk, put our links in the chat. And our website is access, fully accessible with screen readers. 
So first, what do we do? I think it's worth just a, a moment of background about the data I'm gonna show you before I dive into the data for people who are wondering where it's coming from and what it looks like. Um, we have a multidisciplinary team from around the world who's multilingual and they look at original legislation, original constitutions from countries around the world. In the case of constitutions, we do look at equality across a number of dimensions, again, building on, on what my co-panelists have raised. So we look at overall equal rights and non-discrimination clauses, but we also look at how equality is treated in education, health, labor, income, security, family, civil and political rights. For each of these, we look at a lot of dimensions. Now, when we do this, we do it across groups. So from a gender context, we do it for gender and intersectional discrimination. But more broadly, we look within each group at equal rights across gender, race, ethnicity, national origin, religion, social position, age, language, physical disability, intellectual disability, or mental health, social disability, prisoner status, history of being a prisoner, one of the ways that there's a lot of disenfranchisement in the United States, um, sexual orientation and gender identity. If there were better, it, uh, protections around the world on gender expression, we would add that. I look forward to that day. Um, association and, and parentage. We separately look at rights that are truly guaranteed from rights that countries talk about in an aspirational way. This becomes particularly important around equal rights in class. You can have an, a non-discrimination class on a non-discrimination clause on social class. But if fees are charged for education, education is discriminatory, it's not accessible. And that's something that in a lot of constitutions is um, stated in an aspirational or progressive realization way. We do also look at whether the non-discrimination clauses cover indirect discrimination, as well as how they treat affirmative measures or restorative justice and any exceptions they have to write. Exceptions for religious organizations or whether they do as international agreements have said we should do, which is freedom of religion ends when it infringes on the equal rights of others. There's clear international jurisprudence on that limit. So what we do with these data and with these findings is we try to just first understand where the world stands. That's what I'm gonna share in a moment. Make it easy to make rapid comparisons across groups, capture the details in a way that it doesn't take 10,000 hours for an individual to read all of, the, all of the world's constitutions where we can know our rights, but also where we can map trends over time. And for anybody who's listening, who's a quantitative researcher and wants to follow up, or a historian and taking a qualitative approach to it, we do link these to outcome change over time. We have loads of data, it's all freely downloadable on our website, and we're eager to share and support other work around advancing equality. Um, the kind of laws we change it to are across areas. So some constitutions have direct impact, but many of them have impact by changing the nature of law. I'll follow up on what Kate Andreas was saying around labor law, again, one of the as an example, one of the things we would do is say, okay, if there is a guarantee in the constitution around equal rights and labor, does it follow all the way through to labor legislation? And we have a similar detailed database on non-discrimination across all of these dimensions in labor law. 
but we do also cross the other areas mentioned here from you know, education to income um, and a, a wide range. Okay, now we're gonna to go to maps. Maps are our go-to tool to show quickly the state of the world. So what's the state of the world on non-discrimination across sex and or gender? And I have to spend a moment here and say, the reason we say sex and or gender is constitutions do both. Some do sex, some do gender, some do both. And gender means different things in different languages and different parts of the world. So while it would be really nice to distinguish these, um, there is an enormous amount of debate on that, especially in countries that do not have independent words for sex and gender, which some don't. But what's the big picture? The big picture is the map is overwhelmingly green. Green is every country that has a guaranteed equal right based on sex. That is 85% of the world. Uh, very few countries don't have it. So what are the trends over time? Well, before 1970, just over half of countries had put it in. But when you look at new, that's for constitutions originally passed before 1970. But when you look at the ones since 2000, 100%. So that means that when Saudi Arabia amended its constitution, it did put in the vote for women. <laughs> It also means old constitutions that are amended. So it's not, we shouldn't feel like we have an excuse because we have an old constitution. Luxembourg passed its constitution in 1868. It amended it to have gender equality in 2006. So the other constitutions are amending it. And this is basically near universal now. I know others have raised this issue, but I think in the context of, of the debate in the US, it is an important reminder that does it matter to have in the constitution? This simple answer is yes. We've heard that described in a number of ways. I'll just do a few. Um, first, we should never forget that even in the, the best US interpretation we've seen, and we may be about to get far worse, but even in the best, it gets a lower standard of scrutiny. Women get just a little bit less equality than other groups, than are guaranteed for race and religion, which also have been vulnerable, I would argue in part, not only because of where the country is, but because the language is not as specific and expansive in our older constitution. And uh, Michelle raised this as well as it is in more modern constitutions. Uh, but do these clause matters? Yes, this just lists a few cases. Uh, Germany using it to advance parental leave for both parents and ensure that there was incentives for both parents. Nepal using this around changing a marital rape law. Um, you can see the example from Zimbabwe and Tanzania in terms of this disparity in age of legal marriage for girls and boys. So it's really across spheres that it gets used. Kuwait in an employment discrimination case, and in Spain, equal pay for equal value. There is lots of good news about the different ways it gets used. That having been said, um, there's also reason to worry that we need more than an equal rights amendment. So by all means, 38 states, have ratified it, let's ensure 
it's part of the Constitution, but it will not be enough. It's not enough for two reasons, both of which have been raised by my co-panelists. One is the intersectional issue. Most countries that have good case laws addressing intersectional discrimination have multiple protections. This is an example from Canada around a housing discrimination case experienced by a black single mother. And I just highlight it to highlight the fact that they turned to their constitutional protections protecting multiple aspects of identity. So when you look at the world, this is a very different kind of map. This is a world that says, how many aspects of identity does your constitution protect? So the green countries, a smaller number, protect seven plus groups. You know, as an example, the South African constitution, which coming out of apartheid with a broad vision of equality and wide coverage. Um, the red of which the United States is just protects zero to two and most of the world protects three to six. So we do have to worry about those intersectional aspects and who is protected. There are great variations in the probability by group. So I don't know where to do glass half full or half empty on the fact that 76% of the world protects equal rights by race, ethnicity. Um, it's just after religion and sex, gender. It's a very high number. And what happened to that other quarter? How are we in 2022 with a quarter of countries, including some in Europe, by the way, that do not have explicit protections based on that? At the same time, when it comes to sexual orientation and gender identity, we only have five and 3% of constitutions respectively, protecting that intersectional dimension, relatively few protecting foreign citizens or stateless. Now in the middle is one I want to highlight because it both shows limited protection but it shows the potential for change. That's people with disabilities. So right now, it's still a pretty small percentage of the world that covers, it's a minority fraction, people with disabilities. This completely intersects with gender, right? So in the United States, we'll get back to one of the things that was raised by Kiara Bridges, your right to have children, the United States, had laws allowing sterilization of women with disabilities. So uh, I have epilepsy, I have two beautiful uh, sons, and as somebody with epilepsy, an entirely not heritable condition, I would have been legally sterilized. So these are very intersectional elements. What's the good news part about that um, dramatic increase? You know, so since 2010, 71%, that's a, a product, whereas in these earlier years, you see in the earlier decades, in the 70s, 80s, 11, 9%, that's a product of this, of the global disability rights movement. But I use it as a, illustration of the need for us to think about protections across all groups. The last area I want to mention is that we are also going to need to do explicit protections around labor rights, education rights, and health rights. It's not going to be enough without it. When you look at the other countries that have successfully advanced, for example, Education for girls in South Africa, they use both gender equality in the constitution and a basic right to education or gender equality and health in Kenya. Again, using the right to health and the right to gender equality. 
And for time, I won't go through each of the illustrations except to say that having both the fundamental social or economic or labor right and the right to equality matter. Whereas the United States on these, we don't talk about these social and economic rights much. Maybe that's where some of that history of disagreement also came from. But most of the world by now has it. A guaranteed right to education, every country that's green here, which is the majority of countries, has a right to education. Um, if you look by year of constitution adoption since 2000, there is nobody who adopted a new constitution without a right to education. It's not just a right to education. Most of the world has a right to health. Even more have a guaranteed right to health than a right to education. But again, since 2000, every single constitution adopted included a right to health. Income security. Um, this builds on the conversation about family camps. Much of the world has a right to income security built into its constitution. Each of these rights has profound implications for gender equality, but they also have implications for intersectional inequality across class and across race after the long history of discrimination. I will put in the chat like a link to a bunch of the data. This is just from our website and it's to remind me to say, um, the sites being screen readable, the data is available in different languages, English, Spanish, and a series of other languages. But we believe change happens by partnerships. Don't hesitate to reach out. We have a long way to go in this country to come up to speed on our constitutional rights but it is a fight worth staying the journey because they could make an enormous difference. Thanks so much. Thank you. And I completely agree. We have a very, very long way to go. And so thank you for your presentations. I just want to start with a few moderated questions. So I really want to kind of go back to what Professor Bridges was saying around the need for a robust interpretation of the ERA and what that actually means. So I wanted to pose that to you all of, in your area of expertise, you all have very specific areas and disparate areas, which is so great and really grounds us in the whole lived experience that reproductive justice allows. But I would love for each of you to talk a little bit about what can you expand upon what a robust interpretation of the ERA means in your specific expertise area and how the ERA would actually change the legal landscape in those areas of expertise? And so since this kind of question was posed in a way by Professor Bridges, I wanted to start with you. Sure, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, well, I think that um, it's so important for however the Equal Protection Clause or the ERA is, is, is interpreted that it is intentionally um, intersectional in the sense of recognizing um, that people with a capacity for pregnancy are differently situated. Um, and so even though I talked about um, family caps, um, I like to give the example of maternal mortality, which Professor Goodwin talked about as well. Um, it has become, I would say common knowledge at this point, um, but maybe not, <laughs> that uh, Black people with a capacity for pregnancy are three to four times more likely than their white counterparts to die from a pregnancy-related cause, right? So what does sex equality mean with respect to maternal mortality? Um, first, 
there is no obvious comparator there, right? Like, so, you know, women should die as frequently as men die during pregnancy, right? So the, the, the comparator can't be cis men, it can't be people who cannot um, become pregnant. Um, and so we have, to, we have to think about what equality means with respect to, to maternal mortality. And then um, with regard to the different uh, relationships that people of color have to maternal deaths. Um, so right now the national average or the, the, the ratio is 17 um, of every 100,000 live births um, results in the death of the birthing person. Um, people are differently situated to that, to that statistic based on race. So um, white women um, are 12.7 more, 12.7 um, um, out of 100,000 um, white women die during um, pregnancy. Meanwhile, 40.8 um, out of 100,000 black women die during pregnancy. So for me, first equality would mean um, thinking about black women vis-a-vis -vis white women so it's not a it's not a, a kind of unnuanced equality about women to men. Rather, it's a it's an equality of black women to white women, right? That's that sort of intersectionality, like in understanding how race impacts the experience of pregnancy. And then once we get everybody to a national average, let's say of twelve point seven to uh, of 100,000 people dying during childbirth, um, we also have to recognize that that's a pretty bad statistic in and of itself because the US is the worst of industrialized nations when it comes to um, pregnancy related deaths. So then, are, then we, are we comparing the US to other nations that are doing better, you know, the UK, Canada, you know, Norway? Um, so all of that to say that um, sex equality, is, it's not obvious um, what the analysis should be, but uh, at the very least, um, we have to be um, attentive to um, the, the different relationships, um, the different identities, the different um, areas of stratification that um, people with the capacity for pregnancy have um, with respect to one another. So it's just the beginning of an answer. <laughs> I appreciate that. And yes, uh, Jody, if you'd like to go, Professor Heyman. Yeah, maybe Jody is great. <laughs> um, maybe I'll just build on that and say, I, it feels to me like it's just that it's putting too much weight on just sex equality. You know, and, and we do know a lot about our maternal mortality and infant mortality rates and the fact, fact that they are fueled by structural inequalities across many dimensions, that they're fueled by lack of access to healthcare, uh, by labor conditions, you know, uh, parental, you know, on the infant mortality rate, parental leave actually has a very positive impact uh, across countries on lowering infant mortality. So I think we are pressingly need the sex equality, but we do need to make sure it's accompanied by changes in these other areas. If we can do it constitutionally, great, but if we can't, doing it legislatively. I'd love to join in here, if that's all right, Candace. <clears throat> and that is to say, you know, something that we've not talked about, uh, and to add it here would be thinking about uh, matters that are uh, that include every aspect of the lifespan. So we might think about period poverty or menstrual equity as being a part of this. Um, you know, I, I want to build on what has been said that when we think about what this might mean in a robust type of way, then I think that it's um, equality within this space means being able, let's say if we were talking about pregnancy, uh, to be able to carry out one's own agenda, personal agenda, without coercive demands of the state. So that would mean, for example, if one wanted to remain pregnant, being able to remain pregnant with dignity and not be coerced into uh, such um, an undignified position post-birth that could mean death, um, or that would mean 
um, stigmatization and stereotype from the state that blames you for having sex and blames you for having sex because you were poor and then now having these children. But that would also mean the state meeting the moment um, in terms of helping individuals to be able um, to do what they want in space of pregnancy and that includes terminating it. So as we think about you know, the concerns that have been raised in the aftermath of the court taking on the Dobbs decision, it's important to understand that Roe was never the North Star. And then after Roe, there were a series of decisions that came through the United States Supreme Court connected to Hyde or state's own versions of Hyde, where the Supreme Court it stunningly claimed that states had nothing to do with the poverty of women from those states. Clearly that is ignoring the condition of black and brown women in those states, indigenous women, when the state very specifically um, denied right to vote and very specifically carved out um, discriminatory policies, denying them the opportunity to equal employment, education, and all sorts of other things. And so when we think about that, like robust means the state making the country, state, et cetera, um, making sure that individuals are not um, handcuffed by their poverty and being able to live fully under a set of rights. And as I started off, um, I mentioned, you know, period uh, poverty and menstrual equity. I mean, there too, it's something that we ignore that we don't talk about, but the fact that there's still luxury taxes on tampons, um, the fact that there are women in prisons and jails in the United States that have to um, engage in sexual subordination in order to get a tampon, um, the fact that there are commissaries that won't even allow women if they do have the resources to come in, if their gowns or their, their, their clothing is, happens to be bloodied. The fact that we see very similar patterns taking place in American public schools. There are states that are beginning to address this, but I think that once we begin a sort of unpacking the space and what the realities could be, then we can actually think in really nuanced ways that haven't even reached the table. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's that's really, really incredibly helpful. Um, Professor Andreas, do you want to chime in? Yeah, I mean, I agree with what everyone has said. I think I would add that um, you asked us to think about what would a robust interpretation of the ERA look like and how would the ERA change things. And I just want to highlight how contingent that especially the answer to the second question is, I mean, it really depends on, on the politics of it and how we as, um, as citizens, as residents and as social movements take up the question of what does the ERA mean and what does the rest of the constitution mean and what should it mean and not cede that question to the Supreme Court. Um, and so I do think developing arguments about what um, the Equal Protection Clause or the ERA should mean for purposes of litigation is important. And I, I, I appreciated um, uh, Professor Bridges highlighting um, some of the words in dissent, which can, I think, in the future, in the near future, we're likely to see kind of good development um, of those kinds of ideas in dissent more than in majority. Um, and so that's important. But I think really the, um, the action is in working to enact legislation and in, and in defining in, the, in through political organizing um, what equality should mean. And that doesn't mean that it's not a constitutional project because I think that the Supreme Court is not the only entity that gets to decide what the constitution means. But I think it's important not to have, not to have the focus be on kind of allowing the nine, uh, nine or, or six justices to define, um, define the meaning of equality. Thank you so much. And actually, while we're um, talking about this, I would love to for you to expand a little bit of where we are now and the tension between workers' rights and passage of the ERA. And you kind of talked about this a little bit of things have gotten better, but where are we now? Is, is it, are we locked up with one another? Is there still tension? And if there is, how can we overcome that? Yeah, I'd be interested to hear other thoughts. I mean, I think Jody's, um, the way Jody put it, it really resonates um, with my view, which is that um, both um, equality or anti-discrimination and anti-subordination efforts, um, that those are essential, but that they have to be paired with efforts to uh, create um, uh, fundamental kind of social and economic rights for all um, 
citizens and, and residents. Um, and without both of those things, equality, first of all, you, with, if you only focus on um, ge gender discrimination or even the intersection of race and gender discrimination without addressing kind of problems of, um, of um, power dynamics more broadly and uh, economic inequalities, we won't see a, the, an end to gender discrimination or sex equality. That, that they really have to be done together. And so I, I think, um, I don't think there's real tension anymore between the two um, movements. I mean, they're very um, heterogeneous movements, right? There's, so I, I don't wanna overstate, but, um, but rather that, that both goals are essential um, and, have to be, uh, be, and have to be pursued um, in tandem. Um, Thank you. Did anyone else want to comment on that? Awesome. So as the, as the moderator, I'm going to take moderator's privilege as I am the Center for Gender and Sexuality Laws Director of Racial Justice. I want to center race for a moment. And I want to really note that, you know, for many folks, um, probably many that are listening in and tuning into this conversation right now, the ERA still seems very much like a white women's issue and a particular white women's issue. So I really want to talk with and see what your ideas are about how do we shift this narrative to center people of color and what and you know recognizing that people of color are have the most to benefit or some of the most to benefit from a passage of the equal rights amendment um how can we ensure that people of color are are in the center of this conversation yeah do you want to start us off <laughs> Well, you know, I think we have an age old challenge, historical challenge um, in centering uh, people of color and centering uh, women of color. And we have to be honest about it within our movements. And, uh, and I think that's critical, right? So if we were to think about uh, an amendment that has meant a lot, um, recently we celebrated the 100th year anniversary of the uh, ratification of the 19th Amendment. And if you follow that legacy, then it's clear that women of color cared about the right to vote. They did, right? So being erased from that history as if it had been a kind of enterprise of white women is ridiculous. And in fact, indigenous women um, had been a very central part of what ultimately became the United States Constitution in many different ways, but excluded from the narratives and excluded from the histories. And quite physically, quite explicitly physically pushed to the back lines, right, um, done by white sisters. So I think that there's still an interrogation to be made and an understanding of our histories where um, there has been uh, intra-group discrimination um, that continues to persist. And I think that in 2020, in the wake of Breonna Taylor's horrific death and that followed then by George Floyd, there began a series of conversations to look more inwardly and I think that that is critically important. Um, and I think connected to this are also messages about um, who are the feminists. And there is, you know, black feminism, right? There are like groups that have their own feminism. And I, and I think it's important to elevate and lift that up. But I also think that there is a conversation beyond the academic in this space. And that is to say that we also, um, have to work with politicians and we have to work with people in popular, popular media who also don't do a very good job of centering the narratives and stories of people of color and of women. And I think that, you know, it's unfortunate that it's taken this time in these circumstances that now we hear more from New York Times, Washington Post and other, you know, papers of record that tell a story that actually uh, black and brown women had been experiencing for some time. It's now that these are concerns that relate to white women more generally that we see the centering of certain kinds of narratives. So I'll, I'll end it there because I know others on the panel might have so much more to say. And, and I want to add on one piece to what Jody was mentioning it is that you know, the inability to look squarely at what these issues mean also within the space of disability and disability justice, I think is a huge mistake. 
um, it's a really significant mistake. And if we just think about that within the context of voting rights, for example, the fact that in Georgia, they're making it difficult for people to be able to get water or get a sandwich while being in line, what the hell does that mean, right? Like exactly what does that mean? That That is like ripping voting rights away for categories of people for whom it would be very difficult to be in line for seven hours without food or drink or even just be in line seven hours. So anyway, much more could be said about that and I'll stop right there. I just love being on panels with Professor Goodwin and it's a little distracting because I'm like taking notes, I'm learning while also trying to gather my thoughts to respond. Um, but um, I will, you know, so, so the reality is that because of race privilege, white people are going to have the largest platforms in this country. Because of race privilege, white feminists are going to have the largest platforms, the biggest microphones um, when it comes to issues around feminism. Um, the reality though, is that people of color, feminists of color have always been there. Um, even though white people, white women get to stand in as like the subject of these movements, people of color have always been there. Um, Professor Goodman said that, you know, black women have always cared about the right to vote. So the 19th Amendment is not a white woman's issue, even though we only get to see Susan B. Anthony as the, as the advocate for voting rights. Um, Black women have always been there. I like to think about it in the specific context of abortion rights, right? A lot of people think of abortion rights um, as a white woman's issue, right? Because um, these, these uh, reproductive rights organizations um, that have centered around fighting for abortion rights have been helmed by, by white women and they have been funded by affluent white donors. And so we come to associate abort the fight for abortion rights with like white people. And the reality though, statistically, black people with the capacity for pregnancy have higher <laughs> abortion rates for because of structural racism. Let's be clear about that. Um, we have higher abortion rates um, than, than white people, which means that when there are abortion restrictions, our bodies are the ones that are disproportionately coerced into, into motherhood, into carrying a pregnancy to term. Also, abortion rates are a matter of abortion access is a matter of life and death, given the fact of maternal mortality. So you're coercing us into giving birth and then we're three to four times more likely to die um, after having been compelled to engage in this task. So although white women have been like the face and the subject of abortion rights, um, this issue uh, is very, um, it impacts Black women, Black people with a capacity for pregnancy are very lives, right? And we have always been there. Um, we have always been um, fighting for access to control um, our reproductive, the, traje the trajectory of our reproductive lives, Sister Song. Um, we have all these reproductive justice organizations um, that have, um, that understand the import um, of abortion access. So to bring that back to, to um, the ERA, yes, I, I mean, I do agree that um, fighting for sex equality and fighting for the ERA has kind of come to, been under, come to be understood um, as a white woman's issue. Um, but Black people have always been there. Polly Murray, right? She's always been there um, fighting for sex equality. Um, we're fighting for the passage of the ERA today. Um, I think that it involves some sort of self-reflection um, by our white allies right, when to cede space, right? You've been given the platform, you've been given this megaphone. Um, it might be time to pass that microphone. It might be time to step aside on the platform to allow um, people of color to enjoy um, the platform that you do have. And I say that while also being very scared about mascotting, very scared about um, white organizations um, sort of parading people of color in front of it as if to say, oh, this, you know, they, they care too. Um, we have to have an equal um, voice, um, um, an equal seat at the table when we're talking about strategies, when we're talking about um, the, the entire movement. And so I think it involves, again, a little bit of, of self-reflection by our, by our white allies about when to step aside and to pass the mic um, and let the people who are also going to be infected by these issues speak. Yeah, I'll stop there. 
Thank you so much. I mean, you said that was a word. So thank you for that so much for, for all of that. Um, Professor Andreas or, or Heyman, would you like to add anything? Um, you know, everything that's been said is so powerful. I, I guess I'll just add a, a couple of thoughts. Um, I think that um, equal representation, equal leadership matters. And I think allies matter. I think we all have a responsibility to each other across many dimensions of discrimination to stand up and be there to address all kinds of inequality and discrimination. Um, and I think we need, the one piece I would add is, I think we need to start looking more seriously at most policies and laws for how they structure in inequality, because I think it's, throughout much of our legislation related to political inequalities in power. I'll just give one concrete example. Family Medical Leave Act. Great that it passed. I'm so glad it passed. It gave people something. But okay, but what's it mean from an inequality perspective? Um, it's not that it says we're not giving this to black women, we're not giving it to Latin X women, but it's what it does. So how does it do that? It does that because it's unpaid and whites have eight times the wealth as blacks and whites have five times the wealth as Latin X families and therefore some groups can afford to go their savings and others can't. It does that because things we treat as if they're neutral are not neutral. The 50 employees or more to be covered, overwhelmingly the biggest group that doesn't meet that is Latinx workers. Literally zero countries in the world have a minimum size on firm size over 10 besides the United States for the only ones. But we structure that in. It does it by not covering part-time workers. It leaves out women of all colors. But again, it's, that's pretty rare by global standards. So the only real piece I would add is starting to analyze how these practical details of our labor policy, our reproductive health policy, our education policy, and others also structure in inequalities. And I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much. Um, I wanna uh, head over to a question by the audience. Oh, so, so this is from participant Lisa Sales. And she says, speaking of labor laws and la the labor movement, would you have anything to add given the new force arbitration law aiming to end the practice at this point only for sexual assault and sexual harassment? And perhaps a little off topic, but do you have anything to add for those of us who importantly step out in the public sphere to tell our stories, but get terminated for doing so? And I can start on that one. I think it's a, it's a terrific um, new law, but it is um, unfortunate that it isn't broader because no worker should be forced to sign away their right to um, to be forced into um, mandatory arbitration as a condition of employment. So it's a, it's it's a, it's a um, you know a better version of the law would be one that um, prohibits any man contract mandatory um, uh, arbitration agreement that's a condition of employment because there's so much inequity in how these agreements get and uh, agreed to. Employers are repeat players; they're the ones deciding the terms. They're the ones who um, who uh, it creates a whole system of private um, litigation where we don't know the precedent that's being created. Um, there's all sorts of ways in which it doesn't um, workers aren't really given a free choice about where they want to pursue their remedies. So um, and and relatedly, um, you, there is a um, there are protections in the law for being terminated for speaking out about sexual harassment or about um, 
uh, discrimination, but they're very hard um, for workers to take advantage of. Um, and there are ways that those could be strengthened, but, but again, a more universal um, approach in most countries actually exists, which is that the, the burden is actually shifted to employers to show that they are terminating a worker for just cause. So rather than forcing a, the worker who is retaliated against to show that the basis for retaliation was sex discrimination or race discrimination, um, the burden actually shifts is in most places is on the employer to show that there was a good reason for a termination or for a discipline. Um, so on that, on that second point, um, uh, you know, again, I think we want to be working towards um, laws that both condemn race and sex discrimination, but also that protect all workers and that create a default of more equity um, so that um, it's not so hard to pursue these claims. Great. Did anyone else want to add something? Okay, perfect. Oh, I will. Go ahead. I will if nobody else does. I just wanted to give a moment in, in case Michelle or Kiara wanted to. Um, yeah, I just, I just want to build on what Kate was saying. Uh, we have a study going on now to look at human rights commissions in every country in the world and, and what they do around gender and race and labor rights commissions and what they do on gender and race in every country. And, and there's a reason behind it, which is right now the US system imposes all the burden on enforcement on the individual discriminated against. And to your important point, when, when there's retaliation, it also imposes the burden on the person who's retaliated against to find a lawyer, to get a lawyer, to prove it. Um, these are huge obstacles, even if you are advantaged by education, income, social connections, uh, race in every other dimension. And they are insurmountable by many, but there are systems that don't work that way. <laughs> there are systems where there would have to be routine reporting where the accountability is done on a collective basis. And I, I very much think for our anti-discrimination to work, we, we it's not that we should get rid of the individual right to sue, but we need to add these collective mechanisms. Thank you for that. And the next question looks like it's for Professor Bridges, but others can also answer. And this is from Justin Mallory. So they ask, do, do family cap policies apply a uniform ceiling for all families of a certain size, or do they only impose a cap on families that grow while the recipient is on TANF? So as an example, if, in the first example, does a family that enrolls with one adult and two kids get treated more favorably than an already enrolled family that has a new second child? Yeah, yeah great question. Um, so there are many varieties of family cap policies. Um, um, most of them um, are will freeze the size of the grant at the time that the family enrolled. Um, so if you enroll with two children, so there's three people in the family, then your grant will be bigger um, than a, a family that enrolls when there's only two, two people. And because the rationale behind these policies is, are that you're supposed to stop having kids when you're poor. Um, so if you are, if you become a recipient when you already have three children or you know two children, um, um, the state will support you by giving you a grant that satisfies your the standard of need. Um, but any additional children, um, you've 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 not obeyed the state and its command um, not to um, have children while poor. And again, variations on the theme. Um, fortunately, these these, these policies uh, have been. Um, falling um, in because of advocacy. So, like going going back to um, Je, uh, Jody's point, um, it wasn't be, so. These laws are constitutional, right? 1970, the Supreme Court said, "Oh, that's not a problem. That doesn't, you know, raise any substantive due process issues. Doesn't raise any, um, you know, equal protection issues. These are not a problem. Go ahead and pass them if you want to." Um, and many states were like, "All right, cool," including California. <laughs> like people love to think of California as like this blue haven. Um, up until 2016. California had um, a family cap policy. And so, but we have seen a, 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 a sort of acceleration um, in, the, in the demise of these, these uh, um, policies. 
not because any court has said that they're unconstitutional, but rather because of advocacy, because of movements, because people on the ground have showed the inhumanity um, of, 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 of the policy that will deny literally a baby diapers, right? Um, because because the parent decided or or and decided such a lo loaded term because a parent gave birth to a child while poor, right? Query how much autonomy um, is going into um, uh, low income people's uh, childbearing. Like when we don't have access to contraception, when we can't control the conditions under which we have sex, um, when when the, the Hyde Amendment exists, right? And you can't turn to your, your health insurance to cover the cost of abortion services. Um, you know, how much autonomy, how much choice is being exercised um, in childbearing decisions. But yes, that was a long answer to a very actually easy to answer question. <laughs> No, I appreciate I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to ask one more another question that I have for panelists. So if the ERA were passed today, well, let's say let's pass, if it was passed tomorrow, what would still need to be done and to actually ensure that sex and gender equality and or sex and gender equity is actually accessible to all? So what are all the pieces that are needed together with the ERA to actually make this real for folks? So I'd like to start there and I'd like to build from what Professor Bridges was just saying, because we often don't talk about cruelty as being built into law, right? Sort of cruelty being built into legislation and upheld by the Supreme Court. There's a kind of narrative that women and girls are in the spaces that they are because that's what they did. They either didn't do enough of X thing or so forth, right? And so um, it, it's an interesting thing, even as we think right now about Judge Jackson and the nomination to the United States Supreme Court, right? When you don't think about the cases that the Supreme Court heard denying women even to become lawyers, right? Not because, you know, sort of like, look at, well, where are we today? Why does the pipeline look like it does? Because states enacted laws saying you cannot be lawyers. And then state Supreme Courts and the United States Supreme Court said that makes sense to us, right? So paying attention to cruelty as built into the law is important. And I think that that's one of the arcs of um, having an equal rights amendment is to do that work within the constitution. And yet it swings us right back because that's such an important question, Candace. What else, what are the other kind of circumstances, the ecosystems that are important? Because let's be mindful and clear that even now as we speak, voting rights are being challenged voting rights are protected in our United States Constitution, right? So, so even just simply having certain frameworks in the Constitution doesn't guarantee that there won't be states that see, states and private individuals that seek to interfere against those rights becoming real. And I think that the challenge that we've had over time in matters of equality um, is that our constitution in so many ways has existed as a paper document rather than something that has really made rights come alive and real. So in many ways, one might think of our constitution as being more illusory than real when it's come to um, vulnerable groups, marginalized groups seeking to have the kinds of protections that were first thought through about wealthy, property, white gentry. So I think some of those challenges continue to exist being mindful of this court and whether the court that we have today um, would be one that would seek to robustly uphold the rights that are articulated in a constitution if an ERA were to come about. And I think that we still have the challenges at the state level of state encroachments against um, individual civil liberties and freedoms and reproductive freedoms. I'll begin, uh, I'll start um, an, uh, uh, another thought. Um, and that thought is um, just like uh, what Professor Goodwin was saying, um, we have, you know, the constitution is really lofty goals and depending on your, that, you know, beautiful language, right? In the constitution, it's there, um, but it, we really are dependent on people it, uh, the court's interpretation of it, right? Same thing with legislation, right? Like we, the civil, the Voting Rights Act, right? Um, 
past uh, overwhelming, you know, support, um, and it has been gutted uh, by um, a, a conservative court. So law can only get us so far. Um, and so I, I often, I often talk about the importance of cultural change <laughs> um, in these conversations. You know, there's a dialectical relationship between law and culture. Law can push the culture, but culture can definitely push the law. Um, and when we're talking about what, you know, of the passage of an ERA and what would it take for that, the language in the ERA to be meaningful, um, we have to start seeing some shifting in discourses and narratives um, around women, around gender, right? When it comes to reproductive rights, we have to see some, the shifting of discourses um, that, that proclaim that a cis woman's destiny is motherhood, right? We have to see shifting in narratives that, that claim that families, that's a private endeavor, right? And so it, it, it's supposed to be a, a self-contained unit. And so anytime that a family asks or, or demands support from the public, whether it be the public fisc or others, um, that family has failed. So we need shifting of, 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 of narratives, understandings of sex and gender family in order for the language, the text of an ERA to be meaningful. And that's not, it's not gonna be guaranteed simply because the law is passed, rather it's because people have been on the ground um, fighting um, for, for shifts in, in cultural meaning. Thank you so much. I completely agree. I mean, culture and culture shifting, organizing work, grassroots organizing, that's what makes law real. Just putting it in law is, cute, but doesn't really do a lot for us, really, as people of color. Um, so we really have to continue the organizing efforts. And I recognize that we only have a few minutes left. And I wanted to just quickly recognize the some of the questions in the chat and uh, wanted to do a shout out to both Roberta Francis and Julie Stuke for their incredible contributions um, and, and bringing in the voices of Black constitution makers, Black women constitution makers um, into this conversation because that's incredibly important and shouting out Shirley Chisholm and Barbara Jordan and Patsy Mink are really important founders and framers of this constitution. So thank you for, for bringing those folks into to the space as well. And I also wanted to note that this uh, that there will be a recording of this conference for you all to look at. And I wanted to thank the person who shouted out the term made to be marginalized that I, I came up with because I just felt like that was was needed in this space. And with that, I wanted to just invite all of you all to just have a closing comment. So is there anything that you want to say about the ERA that you just haven't had a moment to say or just want to leave folks with a closing remark, whether especially if it's a hopeful remark as we're kind of winding down the end of our symposium, I'd love to just give you all a, a minute to have a last word. Um, and with that, I will start with Professor Goodwin. I will say that the silver lining of these times is that we have the opportunity to do better than we've done before. Thank you so much for having me. And I'll pass it to Professor Heyman. Um, I guess I'll close on what's beyond the, in, the ERA. And I do think we have to make sure our constitution guarantees every aspect of intersectional equality in a meaningful way. So I think sexual orientation and gender identity need to be spelled out to be protected. I think disability and full inclusion and reasonable accommodation need to be spelled out. And even with race protections there, indirect discrimination needs to be spelled out so that we can take on things like voting rights. And finally, I think we urgently need to reinterpret, reinterpret what religious freedom and religious equality means in the context that's been, you know, really well developed across cultures globally, complete freedom of belief, but freedom of action 
gets stopped as soon as it impairs someone else's fundamental human rights. So I think, I think that's a, a big project, both in law and in culture change for the United States. I completely agree. We always have to be looking out for a religious exemption in the wing of any anti-discrimination, non-discrimination protection. And with that, I would love to go to a closing word from Professor Andreas. It's been, I mean, it's been an incredible um, honor to be with everyone over the last two days. And, and that I think is, is some of the hopeful, um, I think that's a hopeful way to, for me to think about this um, moment in time that there are so many people who are committed to, um, to doing better, as Professor Goodwin said. And again, I guess I would just reiterate that I don't think the focus is um, on, needs to be on the particular unconvincing particular justices. I'm, I don't even think that the focus needs to be on changing the text of the Constitution necessarily, because we have a lot of very capacious language in the Constitution, and as as um, and that we have a right to to interpret it, interpret it and instantiate it um, as citizens, as legislators, and as members of this community. And we can we can all do better together. Thank you. And Professor Bridges, the closing word. Um, I, you know, you threw me off when you said hopeful. Um, so I've been sitting here for the past five minutes <laughs> trying to, um, but I guess my, my hopeful observation is Trump lost the election by millions of votes. Um, millions of people poured into the streets after George Floyd was lynched um, in broad daylight. Um, the energy is there. The, the, first of all, we're on the right side of history, number one, objectively true. Secondly, um, the energy is there. People are, people are here. We, are, we have a movement um, and it's, we just have to harness that energy into producing the society that we want and we can do it. We've seen it, you know, I uh, love looking at the civil rights movement. Um, people of color poured into the streets, demanded a change. Um, where they, we were first, you know, not, I wouldn't even say second class citizens, but non people um, became, you know, achieved formal equality. Um, if we can achieve formal equality before, um, we can achieve substantive equality um, in 2020s. Um, so, yeah, that's my hopeful observation. <laughs> Thank you so much. And my hopeful observation well put is too. Having, yes, yes, beautifully put. Um, is having conversations like this. And, uh, you know, young people are what always gives me hope. The next generations who are moving into this work already with an intersectional lens to the work and already critiquing how things have been done in the past. It gives me so much hope and conversations like this. So I want to thank all of you for being a part of this conversation. I want to thank my colleague Ting Ting Chang for being the ER director and the the students that are part of Columbia's Journal for Gender and the Law for putting this on. And thank you all for attending and for questions. This will be recorded. And with that, I will pass it over to my colleague, Ting Ting.